We have another very distinguished award to give. For a long time, the Freedom from Religion Foundation has been offering the Emperor Has No Clothes Award to prominent and distinguished people who tell it like it is about religion. And I think all of you in this room know about the Emperor, the Hans Christian Andersen story about the naked Emperor who pretended that he had the clothes on. And the young boy, he said, he's got nothing on. He just was unafraid to say what it was in spite of the public pressure to think otherwise. So past recipients of our naked emperor have been Ron Reagan, <laughs> Ursula K. Le Guin, <laughs> the philosopher Daniel C. Dennett, I got to hand one of these to Christopher Hitchens in Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> the actress and author Julia Sweeney. <laughs> the Broadway composer Charles Strauss. Were some of you there in Connecticut when he got the award? And uh, Richard Dawkins received it. And many other prominent people. Today, we're very honored to be able to present this award to an internationally known paleoanthropologist. He's a distinguished professor of anthropology whose reputation is based on his actual archaeological work in the field. He's worked in Ethiopia, he's worked in Yemen, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in Jordan for the past 40 years. He's conducted field and laboratory research in paleoanthropology. You might know Donald C. Johansson as the discoverer of the fossil Lucy. <laughs> and when we interviewed him on our radio show, I asked him, how did you spot that little piece of bone, ancient bone? And he says, People had walked past it, and, and they just thought it was dirt and rocks, and he saw it as, as his training. He's, he knew exactly what he was looking at. She's a female hominid, Australopithecine, discovered in Ethiopia in 1974, so 40 years ago. The specimen that he discovered is dated to 3.2 million years ago, the first known member of A. afarensis from the Afar area of Ethiopia thought to be one of the direct ancestors of modern humans. And I have to say, five years ago, I had what was very close, or maybe parallels a religious experience, when I was in Times Square at the Discovery Center, where Lucy is on display. Have any of you seen it there in that area? You can actually go up and see that exact fossil, that exact skeleton that's there. And I went into the room and there were people, but for about 30 or 40 seconds, I was the only person in that room looking at what I thought was my great, 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 great grandma. <laughs> and I got goosebumps, I have to tell you. It was like this feeling of, wow, the continuity and the feeling of how we evolved and where we came from. And Donald C. Johansson is the person who first discovered that. You might not know, he's the only child of Swedish immigrants his father died when he was two, and his mother, who raised him, was a house cleaner. He got his undergrad degree in 66 and his PhD in 1974. So that was a big year for Donald Johansson, 1974. He's now the founding director of the Institute of Human Origins, which is a human evolution think tank at Arizona State University. We've been inviting him for many years to a convention to speak, but it's always coincided with some dig that he was going on somewhere, and he couldn't make it. But this year, we're fortunate. He's got a dig coming up in Mexico, but he was able to squeeze us in before going on that dig. We have a couple of his books here, including a limited number of the that beautiful book called Lucy's Legacy. And then we have uh, Lucy's Legacy, The Quest for Human Origins, specially priced for convention goers. And Don will sign copies of it afterwards. He is an ardent free thinker and non-believer, and we're excited that we're going to be featuring Donald C. Johansson in an upcoming educational ad for the Freedom From Religion Foundation that's going to appear in Scientific American, so watch for that, featuring his face and a free thinking quote. So Donald C. Johansson, where are you?
picture of behind the screen. Sure. So thank you for telling it like it is and saying that the emperor has no clothes. Thank you so much. Wow, we're really here. Thank you so much. You know, I, I haven't read the fine print, but what a wonderful introduction. My gosh, I was sitting there thinking, who's he talking about? Um, you know, often I go into a sellout crowd and they all think that Don Johnson is coming to speak. <laughs> They don't read very well. Um, but uh, I was thinking, I haven't read this, the fine print on what it means to agree with and accept this. So I thought I would bring it up at the beginning and say, now if I have a born again experience, do I magically see clothes on this <laughs> sculpture? Um, this has been a very important part of my life. Um, the study of who we are, where we've come from. It has immense implications, philosophical and otherwise, from everything from medicine to how we look at one another and how we treat one another. And I truly believe that by understanding the deep roots of humanity, the very simple fact that we now know is based on an out of Africa experience, where of course nothing happens. I mean, what happens in Africa, right? Well, everything. Uh, for so many years, beginning in 1856 with the discovery of the Neanderthal skull in Germany, all these white European males got together and figured out that Europe was a finishing school for humanity. Well, that's all, as we say, ancient history. And a guiding principle for me throughout my career has not necessarily been discovery driven to find a specimen, although I did on the 24th of November 40 years ago, Someone asked me, what's the big difference between you and Lucy? I said, well, when I look at Lucy, she doesn't look a day older. <laughs> but it wasn't necessarily that I was hoping to make this colossal discovery of a creature that has become pretty much an icon in terms of paleontology or paleoanthropology. But it was to understand our place in nature. The book that launched my intrigue about where we've come from was a book entitled Man's Place in Nature by Thomas Henry Huxley, who was a tea drinking buddy of Charles Darwin. And they sat and noodled on the question of human evolution. I can see them in, their, in Darwin's garden in Kent. I hope some of you have been there. I've been there on a couple of occasions to visit where Darwin lived and walked. And how they discussed how they were going to bring this shocker to the Victorian world of Great Britain that we actually descended from the apes. And Darwin, as you well know, was very reluctant to do that because he didn't want to upset the household, Emma, who was very religious, his wife. And he only said that light would be thrown on the origin of man until 1871 in his Descent of Man when he articulated a number of scenarios for that. And I read that book, Man's Place in Nature, and I realized that the, the importance of this subject, which paleoanthropology wasn't really a, a moniker until the late 50s or so, was that we have a remarkable record preserved in the Earth's geological strata that connect us with the past, connect us with each other, and I think very importantly, as you will hear, connect us with the natural world. We know every single one of us in this room who the creator was. And that creator was, of course, Mother Nature. And I will have much more to say about that as we get into this discussion this evening. But someone said, what was the most surprising thing about discovering Lucy? I said, well, I said, no one even knew she was missing. <laughs> but I've been asked to comment on why I'm an atheist. And I've always been an atheist. I didn't have to be converted to atheism. I went to church when I was about 12 years old. I remember it distinctly in Hartford, Connecticut, and some friends 
had convinced me they were Scandinavians too, and they said you should come to the Swedish Lutheran Church here on Sunday and see what they're talking about. So I got up unusually early, disturbing my mother, who said, where are you going? Oh, she said, here, you're going. And I said, you know, I'm going to church. She said, what are you doing that for? <laughs> so I said, well, so I went to church and I came home. She said, did they ask you for money? <laughs> I said, yeah, they did. And she said, this little housekeeper, uneducated from Sweden, who immigrated when she was 16 years old, deciding that the new world was a place where everything was happening. She says, the first thing they'll do is control you then they will instill fear in you, and then they will take your money. <laughs> and uh, so at about 11 or 12, I went to see my mentor, who was a German anthropologist, big surprise, who I had met one day, and he gave me a short course in uh, comparative religions and how every society has, does, and will have some sort of creation myth. And of course, I thought lots of them were much more intriguing than a virgin birth, or Noah's Ark. How would you like to have the job cleaning the poop up on that? <laughs> or original sin. And one of the things, oh, by the way, I forgot to point out, where is that clicker for changing the slides? Do you know where it is? Someone's, <laughs> you had it? Oh, my Zeus, where is it? <laughs> ah, there it is. I've just put up a picture here of a familiar place, probably to many of you, uh, the earth. Uh, hashtag for tonight is Lucy40, for those of you who want to make comments. I was at the National Science Writers Conference last Sunday, and there was quite a bit of traffic. And uh, you can reach me at uh, Don Johansson or the Institute of Human Origins uh, that I founded and where I work in Arizona at hashtag, I mean at, at Human Origins ASU. So the thing that alarmed me most about Noah's Ark was, you know, <laughs> If this creator and Noah were supposed to be such wonderful people, why did they leave the dinosaurs behind? <laughs> I thought dinosaurs were really cool as a kid. And finally, I did see a plausible explanation. Oh. <laughs> so you, you see the ark sailing. Oh, crap, that was today? Now, I began to realize that believing in a creator being, someone I couldn't see, someone who was keeping track of me, somebody who I'd be afraid of, was um, really not my cup of tea. I was much more of a, as we say today, a free thinker. And as I went through high school, I had a very adequate education in a public high school, which we should all bring back. I lived in Berkeley for years, and my favorite bumper sticker was, if you think education's expensive, try ignorance. <laughs> and during my education, I began to really b understand that if I were to believe in this mythical creator, and you know, we only had one choice, right? <laughs> Since the downsizing, if you lived in Greece, I mean, we had a whole bunch of gods we could pray to. <laughs> But now, with cutbacks and so on, we're down to one, <laughs> that I would have to, unfortunately, totally reject my objectivity and logic and leap into total fantasy. And I just couldn't see the benefit of that. Now, why, as we all know, I mean, I, if, if someone in the church doesn't know, he says, therefore God. If I say, I don't know, let's find out. Science is such a rewarding, creative, and charming way of looking at the universe. So why do people so resist evolution, the grand unifying theory of biology? Think about this. Bring this up with the next, at the next astrophysics talk you go to. 
when they explain the origins of the cosmos and the string theory and particles that go faster than the speed of light so that they're younger when they extinguish than when they were born, you know? And you go home and you think it's all very logical and you come and say, well, what was the talk about? And you go, well, I can't really <laughs> know exactly. They're trying to figure out the grand unifying theory of the universe, right? It's a pretty big question. A retiring Englishman who went off on a five-year boat cruise once figured out the grand unifying theory of biology. That shows the robustness of the theory of evolution. The same tenets that Darwin suggested and proffered in the middle 1800s are still the core theory of biology. Sure, if he were sitting in the back of the room, I don't think he is, but you know, sometimes people think they can talk to people. Penn and Teller are great. You're like, why can't you talk to dead people? Because they're dead, <laughs> you know? But at any rate, if Darwin were sitting back there and I mentioned DNA, he wouldn't have a clue. He didn't know how things were inherited. He observed and interpreted and understood how important that elusive thing, natural selection, is, but how powerfully explanative it is. And I think that people just don't think. And s part of that has to do, and I don't want to be too anti-clerical, anti-church, I respect people's beliefs. I don't try to destruct them. I understand that if you are born in X culture, you believe in X God, and if you were in Z culture, you be believe in B God, and so on. And it's really a product of how you're brought up. But we see too much in the United States, as I've always said, and before I even knew that there was this foundation, I used to talk about how there was freedom of religion but not from religion in this country. And it starts often very close to home. Darwin, if he were alive today, would probably be very happy with this poster. I want you to support science and reason. So get God's name off the money that we all worship and get in science we trust. I don't think we'll do that, but we do need to get that name off of our money. There is no question. Um, and it does this anti-science aspect of religion is what bothers me, I think, most intensely. And it's personified in this cartoon. Welcome to church, you won't be needing that, it's this in here. <laughs> Just take this brilliant organ out that has evolved over six million years of natural selection that happens to put us at the pinnacle of intelligent life on the planet, in the solar system, and maybe even in the universe, to be so bold. And just take that out and don't use it. The one thing that we can use to solve any and every problem and dilemma facing humankind. I think we have been given the wrong name by a, another Swede, Linnaeus, who calls us homo sapiens, meaning wise man. You read the same newspapers I do. People shooting people on high school campuses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Going after people with axes in New York. I mean, we are wise men. We are still a work in progress, a long way from where we should be to call ourselves human. But I think a more appropriate name for us would be Homo egocentricus. <laughs> well, who do you think about most of the time? Come on, admit it, even as an atheist, yourselves. We think about ourselves. We think about our parents, our grandparents, our children, our grandchildren, maybe five generations of time. But the earth is billions. Life is three and a half billion years old on this planet. If you, oh, maybe somebody like you know, uh, 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 Steve, uh, Steve Jobs with billions of dollars could conceive of what billions are by laying out dollar bills or something. <laughs> it's a big number. And we believe that we're the pinnacle of evolution, that everything was designed to make white European males. <laughs> and, um, there is something very impersonal to most people 
about natural selection. It isn't uh, touchy-feely like a God that creates us, right? That personally creates us in his image. Who did he look like? You, 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 that one over there? He was, we created him in our image, obviously, not in his image. You often see, and sometimes even television documentaries go at this in the wrong perspective, Darwin is dead. No argument with that. <laughs> he is dead, I agree. Evolution is just a theory. Right, you know what? Isaac Newton's dead too, right? But gravity ain't going away. <laughs> Even if his ideas were called the theory of gravity. I regularly lecture to colleges, universities, museums, and it's always interesting to say, raise your hand if you believe in evolution and, and you know, certain percentage. Uh, the only place where less hands would go up than the United States is, of course, Turkey. <laughs> and we're second from the bottom. Um, and I say, it may all surprise you that I don't believe in evolution. And this big sigh of relief. Any more than I believe in gravity. It doesn't take belief, this is a fact. So if you let something go, it's going to fall to the ground. And in biology, going back to Darwin, I think as Jobzanski said, the great geneticist, um, I think I'm supposed to have a blank here, yes, I have to stare at that, uh, that uh, in biology, nothing makes sense except in the light of evolution. Evolution is a fact, it's not good, it's not bad, it has no moral compass. It doesn't, just like gravity, it doesn't care if your grandmother's favorite Dresden China falls to the floor in the middle of an earthquake, which we could have any minute here. <laughs> Evolution doesn't care if tens of thousands of people die of Ebola. Ebola doesn't kill you because you're a bad person or a homosexual or some other deviant. It kills you very simply because you don't have a resistance to Ebola. Oh, I see. And your body, those who lived through Ebola, who had no medical care, probably have the resistance to Ebola. I've not heard anybody say, like with sickle cell anemia and malaria, let's go find out why those people didn't die. From my perspective, I think that a scientific strategy, especially a biological one, with a full understanding of natural selection, gene recombination, mutation, et cetera, and a more aggressive approach to Ebola would have gone much further than we have come thus far. But the West, who had the ability to do that, was fiddling away while Ebola was burning its path through Western Africa, decimating people and setting its sights on places like Europe and North America. Human beings care. That's what's one of the marvelous, exciting things about us. Of course, that's why I love dogs. I guess there's a wonderful dog back there. They care too. But we care because of our family values, because of our moral compass, because we are human beings, and because we are alive. And we so often forget what that means. Richard Dawkins, my distinguished friend, who also has one of these pot-bellied naked guys in his house, <laughs> says, Essentially, we are the lucky ones because we're going to die. And why are we going to die? Because we were born. Because if there were two genes difference, you would not be you. You would be someone else. We need to cherish that. And we have to understand that this is an exciting opportunity to be alive and not sit around and worry about some omnipotent being keeping score to decide whether we're gonna end up in eternal ecstasy or unending damnation. You know, as I say, I, I, how could he have time to keep score on each one of us? He's so damn busy helping people sink six-foot putts in Arizona and get extra points at football games. <laughs> he doesn't have time to keep track of us. So the problem is that people's prayers don't get answered. Why? Well, here it was in the New Yorker. God finds all the prayers of mankind in his spam folder. <laughs> so we now have an explanation. One of the things about natural selection, which we all grow up learning, is the survival of the fittest, which 
I was taught by my mentor at age 13 was really the elimination of the unfit. And if you look at it and think about it, that's a better way to look at it. But the problem with natural selection is that you can't weigh it, you can't see it, you can't buy it from Edmund Scientific, it doesn't come in the color blue or in G flat major. It's where is it? But it is here. And it is that fact that it, it, one cannot see it, we can only see the results of it, that I think make people so reluctant. They have to see a guiding hand or a guiding force that they can imagine or pray to. Now atheists, as I guess there are a few in this room, <laughs> get a pretty bad rap very often. Religious people accuse us of lacking morals, having no family values. Well, unless I'm reading the wrong newspapers, I don't recall any atheists out there beheading people, stoning women to death, or burning people at the stake. <laughs> We're accused of not being spiritual. Look at that moon rise over the moon, or that earth rise over the moon. Does that move you? Does that touch you? Does that titillate you? Does that excite you? Walking home where I live in San Francisco now most of the time, feeling the heavy fog caress my face as I go home at night. Watching nesting birds and chicks born in a, in a uh, window box. These are all moments of great inspiration and great spirituality. Our world is filled with endless moments of inspiration, real inspiration available to each and every human being endowed with a conscious brain created by evolution. We need not rely on creation myths for inspiration. We also know that atheists play unfair. We're always accused of that. No, you can't teach creationism in my science class. Well, if you're gonna teach creationism, as we all have said, why don't we teach astrology with astronomy? And that would end up with something like this. Here's an astrology chart. If you are Aries, Lancer, the stars and planets will not affect your life in any way. Right. And of course, then in medical school, we'd have to teach witchcraft along with medicine. And in chemistry class, alchemy and chemistry. Where's it gonna end? Okay, you American Airlines pilots, today we're going to discuss the flat earth. So you get on a plane in Los Angeles, you're hoping to go see a Metropolitan Opera in New York and the pilot believes in the flat earth, you'll never get there. <laughs> I think our main duty in getting to one of the really core issues of what I'm talking about tonight is to reawaken, as the advert will say, a reverence. I'll, I'll use that word, I'll take that word, for the natural world and our place in the natural world to respect the creativity of the true creator, Mother Nature, to protect her, to take responsibly our responsibilities as the most creative, as well as the most destructive species that have ever lived on Earth. The future is in our hands, and it is time that we stop turning our back on the natural world and started listening to her and working with her. Um, not sure what the next, yes. So. One of our favorite places, the Creation Museum. Boss, you better get down here. I would love to do this. This would be the best Halloween thing I could imagine to do at the wonderful Creation Museum. And uh, we're going to move into just a few illustrations of Lucy. I was asked to, but of course you go there. Where else can you witness the science of cavemen cavorting with their favorite pet dinosaur, Skippy? 5,000 years ago. I mean, did these, is this a time warp and we're back in the dark ages or something? This is lying, cheating, deceiving, warping, perverting people's knowledge to make what? Money. How much money does a creation museum make and at the same time destroys young people's opportunities to look at the world through an open mind. That's what upsets me probably more than anything else about the Creation Museum. 
And of course, I thought I'd show you the great breakthroughs in science from Marie Curie to the great accelerators and how much has been accomplished in religion. <laughs> well, part of my mission in life has been to educate people about the fossil evidence for human evolution. And a creationist asked me to give the single most important talk that I've given in years on Darwin's 100th birthday, 200th birthday, at the National Institutes of Health. And he's a creationist, the head of the National Institutes of Health, as you know. Um, and what was most interesting about that morning when I was given 20 minutes to talk about six million years of evolution, I spoke very quickly, <laughs> was the tea time. Francis Collins, I had known Francis, we had debated, we had had a huge interchange when he says, well, there's just some things that science can't explain, and I said, yes, then it's not science. And yet he, in his worldview, invited me to give one of the keynote speeches. But the most important part of that exposure was a tea when a couple of you know real scientists, in white coats and name tags and all that, came over and they said, oh, we just wanted to tell you how much we enjoyed your talk. We had no idea there was this much evidence for human origins. Because she said, we, all we do, we peer through these electron microscopes and look at, you know, microscopic things and we don't look at the big picture. And thank you for coming here and helping us understand who we are, where we've come from, and why we should be so happy about being humans. That was an unbelievable satisfaction. Well, think of all, oh, so, this is a first shot of Hadar, Ethiopia, that I saw in 1972. And it was a spiritual moment for me. Looking out on these vast badlands, heavily dissected, eroding layer after layer, rich in fossils. I was just leaving, I was still in graduate school at the University of Chicago, and this to me was, we shouldn't use that word epiphany, but for me it certainly was. And as we began to search those deposits, I was asked to say a few words, and it will only be a few words. You see me in the background, much thinner than I am today, and my graduate student, who of course, graduate students do all the work, so he's down there working. <laughs> and uh, I had been walking back to my Land Rover, glanced over my right shoulder, it's a story I've told a gazillion times, and glanced and saw a piece of arm bone from the elbow. And that little fragment of bone, which allows you to flex and extend your arm, was the first piece of Lucy that I recognized. And I knew that because of all the studies and so on in graduate school in anatomy and bones, osteology, and so on and so forth. And we were rewarded with this 3.2 million year old skeleton that picked up the popular moniker of Lucy after Lucy in the sky with diamonds that was, came from the uh, Beatles tape that was playing that evening. This woman on the expedition said, well, if you think it's a female, Don, why don't you call her Lucy? And I said, excuse me, I'm a PhD. <laughs> we don't give cute little names to our fossils. <laughs> well, well, you know what happens when the genie's out of the lamp. Oh, the next morning, are we going back to the Lucy site? You think we'll find more of Lucy's skeleton? How old do you think Lucy was when she became, a, she became an individual? And she is iconic. Everybody, you know, a lot of people think she's the dinosaur at Chicago, which is Sue, but Lucy, is really the poster child for paleoanthropology and human origins. When you read about new discoveries, they're either older than Lucy or younger than Lucy or more complete than Lucy or not as primitive as Lucy or whatever. So this was a remarkable discovery for me. It launched an incredible 20-year series of expeditions we now have over 400 specimens of her species, Australopithecus afarensis, and it also stimulated scientists, mostly young scientists, as it always is, the silverbacks like myself, uh, 
more reluctant to change, but uh, to develop new methodologies and ways of understanding, examining, and studying these specimens. So she did play a very important role uh, beginning in 1974. Well, if you go to the Creation Museum, there she is. She's a four-legged walking quadrupedal knuckle walker because of Dr. Ham. I don't know what he got his doctorate in, but it may have been one of those things you get at Sears. Um, but there ain't no way that Lucy was walking on her knuckles on four legs. So a child goes in and sees this and is impressed by it. The child doesn't know one way or another. My grandchild, Brendan, went to the California Academy of Sciences, he's three years old, with his father, and his father said, well, let's take a picture next to Lucy, where, where your grandfather, the, the thing you found, that he found, and he refused to have his picture taken until I would come stand next to it. And he knows that Lucy walked upright, doesn't bother him. He didn't bother him that she's very old. It didn't bother him. He thought it was so neat that she came from apes. So it's terribly important that we don't shut these minds down so early. Because as you shut them, the longer you have a mind that's shut down, the more time there is for bigotry to develop. Um, all of these creation myths, or many of them, and here you see he's saying, look, it's not personal, it's religious. There have been so many sacrifices in religion, whether it's you know burning at the stake or beheading people or stoning people to death or ripping their heart out and eating live pumping heart or whatever it is that is an Aztec. And what's that left us with? A bunch of dead bodies. Didn't do much to stop the volcanic eruption. The drought never ended. Didn't dispel the locust invasion, did it? No, did nothing. Yet you're going to be surprised that tonight I'm going to propose that all of us begin to make some real sacrifices. What might those sacrifices be? Clean up the oceans. Quit throwing everything just because it disappears into oceans. Stop fishing out species that you think will forever be present and available to you. Last time you saw orange roughy on a menu, huh? 20 years ago, gone. Make some real sacrifices, sacrifices to Mother Nature, who will, unlike the false gods to whom we have made sacrifices, Mother Nature will reward you. I guarantee that. Clean up the oceans, you will live a healthier life. You will reduce the carcinogenic toxins that pollute our fish and poison us. Clean up our air, reduce carbon emissions, Make the sacrifice. Buy a car that doesn't go as fast, that doesn't look as jazzy. Find alternate sources of power and more efficient cars, as I said, that will be. And we will be rewarded with what? Clean air, healthy clean air with reduced pulmonary disease, and we'll all breathe a sigh of relief. I could go on and on about this, but I think you all get the gist. We live, we live in a beautiful world. Here I was at Bryce Canyon not long ago and made this photograph. Stunning to be out with nature. We're the fortunate ones, as I said, each and every human being because we were born. And it's our duty, our primary duty on this planet to be the guardians of the future of this planet for our children, our grandchildren, and many generations beyond that. We need to stop being homo egocentricus and start to become a more deeply contemplative species that makes decisions intelligently, not out of fear, not out of self-interest, not out of how much money we're going to make, but decisions that will help us regain the balance between ourselves and our creator, Mother Nature. And it's time, really, that you know, as we look back on four million years of evolution, three million years of evolution with Lucy, you know, she is a link, right? She wasn't the missing link. She's a link who reminds us of our link to the natural world. She didn't know where she was going. We don't know where we're going. She didn't know that her descendants would end up as homo sapiens. 
But it's an interesting perspective to know that we are united by our past, that we have this commonality of beginning, and that we undoubtedly will have a common future, and I think in many ways a common destiny globally. And as I said, it is time for us to make these decisions responsibly so that we will look back so that our descendants, people we leave, or people who are born from us, will look back on their responsible ancestors and s who stopped acting only with a very short time perspective. And the most important thing from here on forth is to stop acting as if there's someplace else for us to move to. We are destined to be on this, as my late friend Carl Sagan said, on this pale blue dot. And let's take those responsibilities seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.